Are you blessed to be in the assembly? Amen. Amen. Well, let's stand together as we reverence the reading of his word. You might wonder, why do we do this? Why do we stand up? I just got the memory foam in the right position. And, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been standing and now I'm asked to stand up. I'm going to tell you where we get this from. We get this from the book of Nehemiah. When the word was read, they all stood. And the difference between the Old Testament and the New is they remained standing as long as the word was read. And that was eight hours. So we're in the days of grace. So we just stand for the uh, uh, initial reading and the prayer and then we're seated. But it's just a reverence and a respect for the word of God. That's why we do it. But it's not anything that I made up. It's uh, what you see in the word. And we want to be D-O-D-A-B-O-O-K Christians, right? What does that mean? Do the book. All right. James chapter 1, when you get there, just say amen. One of y'all are there. James chapter 1. I might didn't tell you where to go. James chapter 1, and we're going to look at it down in verse number 22. James chapter 1, verse number 22. So there are so many people, and we really can't get a number of the number of people that Word of God is able to reach just through our, our live stream and, and just all over, literally all over the world. We, we know people are watching our live stream that are tuned in. Um, our television broadcasts, we're on two international channels. We're on 26 national channels in various places. So there's no way to really wrap our head around how many people with, that we reach. But, you know, there's a team of people that make everything we do possible so that we can reach people all around the world. And these individuals aren't in front of the camera and they're not behind the microphone, but if it weren't for them, you wouldn't see anything on a camera and you wouldn't hear anything on a microphone. And the head of our tech group that makes all these things happen, our technical director, uh, Daniel, is somewhere, I told you don't go that far back there. Now you got to work your way all the way forward. He, he's not seen on camera, he's not heard on a mic, but he is our technical director, and today is his birthday, so we're going to honor him today, amen? Come on up here, Daniel. I got a, I got a gift for you in my, in my office. I'll give to you after service, but uh, man, I just want everybody, get, I'm going to get you right up here. Get, right, get Just stand right there. I couldn't stand right there and be seen if it weren't for you. If you just get right there, amen. Can we give it up for Daniel? Daniel we love you, man. And he's like... Sometimes the first one here, last one to leave, an amazing team. And Daniel, I just want you to know that you are a godsend. And that uh, for me and my family, our staff, this ministry, we love you. We respect you. We know you have a heart for the kingdom. You're not just a technical director. You're a, an enthusiast of apologetics. You teach people how to defend their faith. You're a student of the word, a teacher of the word. And you're, you're just an amazing, still going to call you young man, an amazing young man, and this ministry is blessed to have you a part of our family. So forgive me for calling you up here, but you needed to be seen. So look at the camera, smile. So this is the guy that makes it happen, all right? Anything you want to share? Okay, that's just what he does. All right, I love you, man. Hallelujah. James chapter number one, if you're there, say amen. We're going to look at it in verse number 22. Now, if I could get our Shreveport and our Bossier campus to read this verse out loud with me, let's do that now. Ready? Read, I didn't know if I gave you the verse. Verse 22, ready, read. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. One more time. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the faith that cometh by hearing and hearing by your word. And I ask, Father, by your Holy Spirit, that you would be our teacher, and that by your Holy Spirit, you would give us spiritual understanding and wisdom. We ask you for a conviction of truth, words of hope, faith, and salvation. I ask, Father, that you would speak through me what you would have spoken. Lord, override my premeditated and studied thought. May your Spirit speak by me, and may your word be on my tongue. According to Psalm 45, 1, I ask that you would make my tongue the pen of a ready, alert, and sensitive writer that I could write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, your anointed word that removes our burdens and destroys our yokes forever. As we boldly declare that, Satan is defeated. We are redeemed, and Jesus is Lord. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Tell three people around you, be a dutiful Christian, all right? You post that hashtag, do the book, one word, all right? So last week, we began to talk about the process of faith, the, the, the process of applying God's word and, and what it's like to truly live by faith. And if you weren't here last week, the steps that we've gathered when it comes to living by faith are, number one, hearing Romans 10, 17 says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I can't live by faith if I've not heard his word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Before you say you don't believe something, ask yourself the question, have I heard this? Because how can I believe what I have not heard? And that's the case that's made in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. When you look at Romans 10 and start all the way back in verse number 8, you find that for faith to be operative, for faith to be functional, faith begins with what I hear, but it continues through my belief that I have to choose to believe. And not just believe, but to plant the word in my heart, which we talked about in the previous series in the law of sowing, getting the word in my heart, sowing the word in my heart. We've been talking about it in our Sunday series, dealing with paying attention and the process of putting the word of God in our heart and recognizing that according to Proverbs 4.23, nothing can end up in my life that has not come through my heart. That's the process. And so when you look at the process of faith and the application of faith, it begins with hearing God's word. And right now, whether you're here in this assembly or our Bossier campus or watching a telecast or, or, or a live stream or, or streaming us on YouTube right now, you've made a decision to hear God's word. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The next step is to meditate, to meditate on what God's word is saying, to spend time meditating on his word to make sure that his word is planted in your heart. And then now, once that word has been planted in your heart, Jesus said, that's what's gonna happen as you speak, is that word is gonna come out. And you're gonna begin to confess and speak the word of God over your life. And that's the kind of life that God has called us to live. So I wanna look at a few verses just to prove that. So if you would, we, we, let me read uh, James 1, 22 one more time, and there's some places I want us to turn to. But let's read verse 22 out loud one more time, Shreveport, and our Bozier campus ready. Read, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. With that in mind, if you would, turn back with me to the Old Testament, and I want to go to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter number one. So God says, hear my word, hear my word, Will you read that in Romans 10, 8 through 17? Believe my word, spend time meditating, thinking on my word. Romans 10, 10 says, with the heart man believes, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So Romans 10, when speaking of faith and salvation, lists specifically hearing the word, believing the word, and confessing the word. Say that out loud. Hearing the word, believing the word, and confessing the word. But we just read in James 1.22 where the word said, hey, don't just be a hearer, be a doer. Don't just hear the word and, and not go any further. Be a doer of what you hear. Apply the word of God to your life. Be a doer of the word. And so we know that there has to be another step, and James 1.22 just told us, and that is acting out on the word, doing the word, applying the word to my life. So I'm hearing, I'm meditating, I'm confessing, 
and I'm acting. If you think you got that, say it out loud. I'm hearing, I'm meditating, I'm confessing, and I'm acting. And whether you're studying the Old Testament or the New Testament, you're not going to find the application of faith without at least having those four steps. I've heard what the Word said. I spent time meditating on what the Word said. I'm now confessing over my life what the Word said. And now I am acting on the Word of God. If you got that, say amen. If you would, turn with me to Joshua. I want to go to chapter 1. Joshua chapter number 1. Joshua chapter number 1. Notice this in um, verse number 8. Joshua chapter 1, verse number 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Now, what did that just mean? It meant before you confess the word, before you declare the word, make sure that you have spent time meditating on the word. Think of it this way. I need to have what I say to have what I say. Oh, man, come on, somebody. I need to have what I say to have what I say. I think sometimes we speak a thing prematurely. And God's order here is, is that I'm hearing the word, I'm meditating on the word, and I am confessing the word. Now, there are some that would argue this because I've done radio ministry before television ministry. So, uh, you know, back in the days of radio, people would write in and, and I've, I've got a chance to hear a lot of comments and traveling around and hearing people debate the Bible, on which I don't really have time to do. But I, I know there is some, some argument about, okay, well, is it really that important that I'm confessing the word of God over my life? So I thought you might ask that question. So I'm staying in Joshua, but I want to read from John chapter number 15 real quick. And you can add this to your notes in John chapter 15, okay? I'm going to read verses 7 and 8. Just put it in your notes. If you can turn there and not lose Joshua, great. All right, but watch this. Jesus in John 15, 7 says this. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Now, I'm going to stop right there. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. So Jesus in John 15, 7 is saying, well, let me say this. Before he says what he says, he says if. And if means this is on you now. If. It goes back to if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If is a big word to only have two letters in it. If, it's on you. So he says here, if you abide in me, Willie, man, there you are. Glory to God. Man, I'm missing you Sunday. You wasn't in your spot. I got nervous. <laughs> Hallelujah. Man, they come over here and shake your hand, man. Glory to God. I miss you, man. Let me just come over. Y'all, oh, pardon my interruption. Let me, get, let me get to it. Amen. Love you, man. I miss you on that front row banging on that Bible, man. You got folk wondering where you at, man. Did you ever miss that many church again without telling me something? Just kidding. Love you guys. Watch this. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. I should have had y'all turn there. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. So I got to have his word in me. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, watch this. You shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. You shall ask what you will and it shall be done. What's Jesus saying? If my word is in you and you speak my word, my word will work. Oh, glory to God. My word will work. There are too many believers that don't know how to pray. And I'm not saying that in a critical manner in like, oh, you know, we're a bunch of ignorant Christians. No, we've got to learn that there is not a more powerful prayer than praying the word of God. John, uh, uh, John is making this case, the words of Jesus, if you abide in me, my words are in you. Ask what you will and it shall be done. But notice Jesus is saying before you ask and speak and confess my word, make sure that my word is actually in you. Are y'all with me? Another verse for your notes would be Isaiah 55, 11, where God said, beginning in verse 8, Mr. Heron's favorite verse, am I right? In beginning in verse 8 where he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. For as my thoughts and my ways are higher than your thoughts and, and ways. And we're like, okay, God, how do I know your thought? How do I know your way? 
And then he explains it in verse number 11. That he sent his word. That he gave us his word. And that it is through his word that we can know his thoughts and we can know his ways. But he says something powerful in Isaiah 55, 11. He says this, my word shall not return unto me void. My word shall not return unto me void. What if we took that literally? What if we literally looked into God's word and said this won't return unto him void and we read his word and meditated in his word and then that was what we confessed. That's what we declared over our lives and and, and, and stood in faith that that word would not return back unto him void. And we didn't just hear the word and meditate and confess. We acted like it was so. We acted on the word. We did what the word told us to do. Because we had the faith that if I just do what God's word says to do, it will work in my favor. When Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 that if you'll treat um, others the way you want to be treated, that takes faith. you got to believe that if I treat others the way I want to be treated, that that word will not return unto him void and he will bless and enrich my life. But it takes faith sometimes to hear what Jesus, no, all the time. It takes faith to hear his word, believe his word, and then step out on his word, not knowing knowing what's going to happen, but to leave it in his hands. But that is the law of motion, that anytime you take God at his word and you are moved by his word, you will not fail. God will not let you fail. Why? His word will not return unto him void. But we got to have the faith to make that step. But how can I have the faith to make that step when I haven't been hearing, meditating, confessing, and getting that word in me? And then Jesus says in verse 8 of John 15 that when I do that, his father is glorified. His father is glorified. We need to to, 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 to discover the word, get in the word, pull the word off the pages, get it in our heart, get it in our mouth, get it in our life. Numbers um, 23, 19 says that God is not a man that he should lie. If he spoke it, he'll make it good. If he said it, he'll bring it to pass. And then in Isaiah, he literally challenges us in Isaiah. He says, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. That's over in Isaiah 34, verse number 16. He says, seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. No one of these will fail. I got to make sure I'm telling you right. What did I tell you? 34, 16. Ooh, help me, Jesus. Got to get me a little pulpit down here. Yeah, 34, 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. There's a challenge from God. Get in my word and see what I said. And you'll see that nothing I've said will fail. My word will always come to pass. So we got to get in his word. Everybody with me? Okay, now back to Joshua. Back Back to my Bible upside down. Jo- back to Joshua, chapter one. Everybody good? I get the hollering and stuff. I'm not mad at anybody. All right, I'm just, I just get passionate about this thing. Watch this in verse eight. The, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Now you you, you read that and you say, what am I, am I am I not supposed to speak the word of God? No, no, you are. But notice what he says. Do first. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night. So I know now my meditating on the word comes before my confessing of the word. If you don't have what you say, somebody will talk you out of what you say. I've watched coach on a court with with our players and he'll tell them what to do. And every once in a while we have a frisbee head. I love them boys, but you know, they, 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 they they won't take coach at what he said. Man played in the NBA, he knows more than I do, and more than these youngsters, you used to be one of them, and you used to be one of them, you used to be one of them. I'm pointing y'all out. <laughs> and I'm, I'm picking on my boys, though. And then, and then when they do what he'd say, it would work, and he'd be over there grinning, you know, smiling, like, I tried to tell you that will work. You just had to do it. Am I telling the truth, coach? So you, 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 you have to step out and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to act on this word. We have got to get to a place where we act on his word. But watch this. No, no, no teenage high school player is going to tell coach 
that won't work and, and, and talk him out of what he said. Why? Because he has what he says when he says what he has. Y'all ain't going to do me right when the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Initially, that evidence is me treating his word like a title deed, where I'm treating this word like a receipt, that this is the evidence that I have, what even I don't see yet. But you don't have to live faith but for a little while before you see that this word will work in your life. And when this word manifest in your life you now have the life experience evidence that the word will work and somebody can come around and tell you tithing don't work this don't work. if you have lived it you have the evidence of it and you cannot be talked out of it you can't tell me Jesus ain't Lord you can't tell me he don't say you can't tell me he don't change lives it doesn't matter what you say to me you cannot talk me out of Jesus because he's done too much in my life he's done too much for me not to believe So for me personally, when I say Jesus, I have Jesus. I have what I say because I have him in my heart. Amen. You got to have what you say to have what you say. Is this making sense? Tell your neighbor, have what you say. Tell somebody else and then you'll have what you say. Verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt what? So before it's coming out of my mouth, what am I doing? I'm not teaching you some crazy off the wall stuff. We're in the book. Well, why do I need to be meditating before I'm confessing? Because there's something that's going to follow. See, look in the middle of verse 8. That thou mayest observe to do. That thou mayest observe to do. Do what? According to all that is written therein. Oh, let's read that out loud, Shreveport Bozier. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. So in other words, he's saying, I don't want you just uh, uh, hearing and confessing. I want you to hear it. I want you to meditate on it day and night. I want you to get it in you. When you get it in you, then you can start speaking it. But more importantly, I need you to do what it says do. Act out on it. Live it. If God says do it, do it. Take me at my word. That's what he's saying. Now, what will happen when I hear meditate, confess, and act on the word. Watch what he says will happen in the latter part of that verse, verse eight. For then, read it out loud. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have what? Good success. It'll work. That's what he's saying. Success means it worked. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Success means it worked. And he just gave me the order. Here, meditate day and night, confess and do, act. Act. And we're going to build up some faith in this service right now. I just sensed it during worship. Because you might be thinking, okay, what all does it take? I'm going to show you in this word, it don't even take a whole lot. God just wants you to move. He'll meet you right where you're at. It won't take but a little something. Just a little something. Just a little something. And God, and, ooh, ooh, wait, 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 give me a few minutes. Now flip over to Joshua 6. Because, you know, we, we read stuff about Abraham on Mount Moriah. And we're like, oh, I could have never done that. And we read of Elijah on Mount Carmel. I said, oh, man, I could have never done that. And we read of David and his sling and Goliath. And might think, oh, I don't know if I could have ever done that. But I'm glad there's some folk in the Word that just did a little something. Hey! I'm not saying I don't want to be a giant killer. 
I'm just saying that God will bless any act of faith. Amen. Sometimes he's just waiting on you to give him something. Just, 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 just give me something to work with. Just, just show me a little bit of your response to my word. Just give me a little something. There, there, there's power when I act out on his word. I'm going to show it to you here in a moment. But let's look at one more big thing. Joshua chapter number 6. When you get there, say amen. amen. Verse 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See. See, vision is everything. See that I have given into thine hand, Jericho. That's what I need you to see. I know you see a wall, but I need you to see I've given it to you. Because if you can't see it, you never will. So if you say, I can't see it, don't worry, you won't. You got to see it to see it, just like you got to have it to have it. Woo! So he said, I want you to see that I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof, the mighty men of valor. And I want you to compass the city, all ye men of war, and go around about the city once. And I want you to do that for six days. And I want you to see during them six days that I've given you the city. You, we cannot forget what we just read in Joshua 1.8. Joshua 1 8 said, Before the word comes out of your mouth, do what? Meditate in it. I didn't make it up. We read it in Joshua 1 verse 8. He said, Now, before you go to speak in the word, make sure you're meditating in it. Then confess it. Then do what it says. So here they are, and God's getting ready to give them Jericho. And Lord willing, this year we're going to do a whole study on the book of Joshua. So this will come back up and we'll get into more detail. But, but watch this. He said, Go around this city for six days. And then I want you to do something different on the seventh day. Verse 5, and it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout and the wall of the city shall fall down flat and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. But there's something interesting here. Go to verse 10. Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice. Oh, oh read up to that comma out loud. Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth. What? Until the day I bid you shout, and then shout. God told Joshua, chapter 1, verse 8, I'm, when I give you my word, I want you to hear it and meditate on it day and night. But don't let it come out of your mouth yet. Meditate on it first. Five chapters later, Joshua chapter 6, God's getting ready to give them the, the, the city of Jericho. God speaks through the prophet or through Joshua and says, listen, we're going to go around this city for six days. And I want you to see, see that God has given you the city. But I don't want you making a noise. So then what do you think they were doing six days walking around that city? They were meditating on what God had said that he had given them the city. Can you imagine them walking around that city just meditating? He's given us a city. 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 They ain't saying nothing out loud. I'm just saying for you to know what I'm thinking. He's given us a city. He's given us a city. And meditate, meditate, meditate. Not a peep, not a noise. Nobody's saying nothing. Nobody can tell somebody else, that step don't work. And then when it came time and, and the people were told to shout, they let out a shout that brought the walls down and they took the city. 
but they had to take the city before they could take the city. And there was a process in which God had given them to take the city. We've got to begin to recognize there is power when I hear his word, power when I meditate on his word, power when I confess his word, power when I act out on his word. And that's exactly what we're seeing right here in Joshua chapter number six. They took him at his word. And it happened because on that seventh day, verse 16, and it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, shout for the Lord hath given you the city. And, the, and, and, and they shouted and they took the city. Glory to God. And only Rahab was spared. That's a, another sermon we'll get into when we study that book. Look at the power of just doing what God said. The process of faith, recognizing I hear, I, can, I meditate, I confess, and I act. Acting on the word. Acting on the word. Something happens when I move on his word. Something happens when I move by his word. That's why every believer ought to read the Sermon on the Mount regularly. Because that is everyday stuff on how we're supposed to live our lives as believers and to advance the kingdom in this world. And if I hear it enough and meditate on it enough and confess it enough, then I act out on it and I can become the very kingdom ambassador that Jesus has called me to be. And when you pull up at a drive through window somewhere, you don't say have a good day. You say have a blessed day because you've read the Sermon on the Mount and you recognize that it's the heart of God to bring forth blessing upon his people and blessing to people through his people. So it's not enough to say have a great day, have a good day. No, I use kingdom language. Have a blessed day because I recognize I'm blessed to be a blessing and there is power in my words. And when I say have a blessed day, I'm believing that I have released that thing as an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven in my life. Now, that's, that not work. that's because you've not heard and meditated. Once you get it, you'll get it. Oh. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You'll start blessing your children. You'll start blessing your family. You'll begin to recognize the power of words. Everything changes when I meditate on his word and allow his word to be the source of my conversation and my action. It will always work. His word will not return unto him void. And even if it doesn't look like it's working, you're going to find out in time that it is. We get like Peter in Luke 5. Peter in Luke 5 let Jesus borrow his boat. And Jesus preached out of Peter's boat. And when they were through preaching, he said, Peter, I want you to drop down your nets for a drought of fishes. And Peter might as well say, you're a preacher, I'm a fisherman. I've been fishing all night. There ain't no fish. And I'm going to tell you exactly what Peter said, all right? Simon answered, said, Master, we've toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. That's verse 6 of Luke 5. I want you to listen to that again. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Well, number one, Jesus didn't say let down no net. He said let down the nets. But he let down the net, and the net broke because there were so many fish. And when that, when that happened, he bowed himself before the Lord and said, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Why? I should have took you completely at your word. His partners came in there. Thank God for support systems when our nets break. I need to say that again. Thank God for support systems when our net break. Because his net break, but there was not a loss because he had people that were in partnership with him that were there to help him gather up what would have been a loss had he not had some partnership in his life. Partnership is powerful. Friends are important in life. Amen. Because sometimes our nets break. Amen. But even though he didn't take Jesus completely at his word, he walked in the harvest because that letting down of the net was based on the word of God, and the word of God will not return unto him void. That is the blessing of God, that he won't let that word return unto him void. Isn't that a good God? Isn't that a faithful God, that he would not let his word return unto him void? Can y'all turn with me to 2 Kings? 2 Kings, I want to go to chapter 4. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Yes. 
2 Kings chapter 4. We'll look at it in verse 1. When you get there, say amen. And there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets of Elijah, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come. Now, I don't know who this word is for. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? She said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Oh, Shreveport Bozier. Beginning with, and she said, let's read it out loud. Ready? Read. And she said, thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. You know why we miss our miracle? We think we don't have enough. Only the enemy works with what we don't have. God always works with what we do have. Only the enemy works with what we don't have. That's where discontentment comes from. That's where jealousy comes from. That's where frustration comes from. That's where expectation comes from. Don't miss Sunday. Lord willing, Sunday we're beginning a new series called Addressing the Issues. And we're going to talk about insecurity and expectation and how they work together. And we're living in a culture right now, a society, where there's insecurity and expectation. And there's so many people that are insecure in their own walk that they have an expectation from others to help their insecurity. Oh, it's going to be heavy. Don't miss it. It's going to help some folk. I'm telling you, it's going to be powerful. Expectation in people, in light of my lack, when the only person, the only place we're supposed to put expectation biblically is toward God. Sunday. Watch this, watch this. The enemy says, you don't have enough to do this. You don't have enough to do this. You don't have enough. The enemies want to talk us out of doing the book because of what we don't have. But God will always meet you with what you do have. So here's a woman that's about to lose her children over the death of her husband. And, and the creditors have come. And they're going to take her boys for, for, to pay, as payment of the debt. And she said, well, what am I going to do, Elijah? Elijah didn't say, how much money you got? He said, well, tell, me, just tell me what you have. Despise not the day of small beginnings. Don't forget that Psalm 126, verse 5 and 6 says, He that goeth forth weeping, weeping, bearing precious seed. I'm at the bottom of the barrel. This is the last thing I got. Shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his harvest with him. All God needs is what you have. He will never ask of you what you don't have. So he said, what do you have? She said, all I got some oil. He said, well, go borrow you some vessels from your neighbors. Get empty vessels. Don't get no few. Verse 3. You might say, it don't say you don't, don't get no few. That's what it means in Hebrew. Borrow not a few. Don't get no few. <laughs> Bad English, but real good preaching. And when you are come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shalt pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. And she went from him and shut the door upon her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full, she said unto her son, bring me yet another vessel. He said, there's no more vessels and, and the oil stayed. And then she came and told the man of God and he said, I want you to go sell the oil, Sell their oil and pay the debt and live thou and thy children off the rest. Not only was there enough in her house to, to meet the need of the debt, there was enough for us to live off of the rest of our life. You say, did she have that much oil? I don't believe she had that much oil. I believe that God multiplied the oil because she acted it on his word. You just give God what you have and he'll stretch it beyond anything you could ever imagine. That's what happened when Jesus turned the water into wine. That's what happened when they gave him two two fish and five barley loaves and he blessed it and break it and fed 5,000 men, not including women and children. God multiplied it in the basket because they acted on his word. Amen. 
One more. Go with me to 2 Kings 6. Second Kings 6. We're trying to figure out what God has already worked out. Whoo, glory to God. Man, if I had time, I'd tell you some testimonies. Where I've seen the Lord just take a little something. And take it further than I could have ever imagined. It's, it's been, it ain't been that long ago I gave you my $2 testimony. So I ain't going to use that one again. <laughs> but I'll never forget what God did with them $2. You say, why $2? Because that was all I had. Whew. Glory to God. Not going to talk me out of this. Second Kings chapter 6, when you get there, say amen. And we'll look at it starting in verse number 4. Well, let me start in verse 1 so we'll see the whole context. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold, now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. So they were going to go basically build a house. We need a place to live, a place to dwell. He answered, Go ye. So they're going to cut down some wood, build a house, a place to live. Trying to make this relatable to you. Verse 3. And one said, be content. I pray thee and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. Why are they cutting down wood? To build a house. Let's make it sound good for television. I'm going to ask a question. Everybody answer, right? Uh, why were they cutting down wood? All right. <laughs> But as one was felling a beam, or cutting a beam, the axe head fell into the water. Why was he cutting the beam? To build a house. And the beam broke off the axe handle and went into the water. And he cried, alas, master. Read the next line. For it was borrowed. So why did the man borrow an axe head? To build a house. I'm hoping that just kind of almost settles in. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand that's ever done any borrowing to build a house or to buy a house. But you get the point. He borrowed an axe head. Some of y'all right now saying, that's all I should have borrowed. Man, a little axe head. He, he bought an axe head to cut down some trees to build a house. And while he's cutting the wood, the axe head fell off and went in the water. He said, oh, master, it was borrowed. Verse 6, and the man of God said, where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in tither. Read the next statement out loud. And the iron did swim. Iron don't swim. You might also say debts aren't miraculously canceled. Iron don't swim. Why, why did the man go to a prophet? He should have went to the man he borrowed the axe head from and said, man, I've lost the axe head. I cut the beam thing, fell in the water, it sunk. I, I, it's over. Man, what I got to do? But no, he went to a prophet. Why? Because the prophet spoke for God. He wanted a word. Give me a word. This thing was borrowed. Give me a word. He said, I'll give you a word. Take this stick and throw it where it fell. And that might sound stupid. I'm going to take a stick and throw it where the axe head. I ain't doing all that silly stuff. But he took God at his word. And when he took God at his word, that axe head came right back to him. It was a miracle. Now, you might say right now, oh, that's ridiculous. I don't know how, I, I, how that would work. Faith, take God at his word. 
whatever the Lord tells you to do, take him at his word. He said in verse 7, take it up to thee and put it, and he put it out of his hand and he took it. Miracle. Can we go to the New Testament and see a miracle? Let's go to the New Testament. Go with me to Acts 12. That's where we'll close. We just went to God first. I dare you to believe. And I mean that in a positive way, a challenge. Take him at his word. Get in his word. Find his word. Take him at his word. First Corinthians 10, 6 says all these things were written to serve us as an example that we could learn from. David didn't beat Goliath with Saul's armor and Saul's sword. That belonged to Saul. That was made for Saul. It wasn't made for David. I'm sensing the Holy Spirit in here. There's a miracle that fits you. And God's not going to call you to be who you're not. David didn't need Saul's armor. Even after he put it on, it didn't fit. Hmm. Because it wasn't made for him. When God put that giant in front of David, David already had what he needed. We're looking for what we don't have. When God gave it to you, you already had everything you needed. We're not moving, waiting for something. And God, when he gave you the word, you already had what you needed. David had a rock and a sling, and that was all he would need. Have you ever read to realize that Goliath was wearing a brass helmet? What good is a rock when the man wearing a helmet? Because God's super got on his natural. And when you give God your natural, he'll put his super on it. And it'll go further and do more than anything that you could have ever achieved. But God can't put his super on your natural. See, oh, watch this, watch this, watch this. We ask God for the super natural. But God can't put the super when you don't give the natural. His super is on your natural. You do the natural. He does the super. But for many of us, we won't do anything. We won't, we, won't, we won't start the motion. We won't step out. We won't move. And because there's no motion, there's no super on the natural because there wasn't any natural in the first place. You already have what you need. Act on what you got. Move with what you have. Quit waiting on more. Be faithful over little. Get in motion with what you got. You say, well, my dream is to own my own business. Where are you at right now? I'm working for another man. Then work for that man and treat his business like it was your business. Manage it like it's yours. 
Where did you get that from? Luke 16, where Jesus said, if you cannot be faithful over that which is another man's, I cannot give you that which is your own. And we want to lie and cheat and steal and do wrong by the people we're employed by all the while saying, I'm believing God for my own business. No, you're not going to ever get there because you, you, you have not been faithful where you were. You didn't, put, you didn't give God a way to put the super on your natural and, and, and your future is hindered. You've got to go back around the mountain again till you get this thing right. Start where you are. You say, well, if I had a new car, I'd keep it clean. Keep your old one clean. Vacuum that old dirty thing up, get them fries out from under the seat and wipe that ketchup off the steering wheel. I said, what are you doing? I'm acting like I got my new one. I'm creating a new discipline. I'm going to show God I can be faithful over more by being faithful over least. All God wants is for you and I to move with what we have. The examples I've shown you in the Word are been with what the person already had. The woman was getting ready to lose her children. Elijah said, what do you have? She said, I got some oil. Sell it. Ain't nobody buying oil. They about to. Ah, <laughs> oh, prophet, prophet, I, I lost my accent. I lost the accent. So, you know, that one was borrowed. Where? Where did it fall? You missed it. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, 5,000 here. The day is late. We don't have enough money to go to the store. And even if we did, it's too far. The folk are hungry. Jesus said, what do you have? What do you have? That's what he said. What do you have? They said, well, a little boy here got five barley loaves and two fish. Bring it to me. All I need is what you got. Jesus, Jesus, we, we run out of wine. They've run out of wine. Woman, what have I to do with thee? Is this my hour? We have no wine. Pour water in the vessels. You got water? We got water. Pour water in there. Water. Yeah, trust me. Take me at my word. Put water in there. He ain't never going to ask you for what you don't have. Move with what you do. Last example, Acts 12. If you're there, say amen. Peter is in prison. Peter is in prison. And church is praying. Everybody there? Verse 4. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quartirians of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people after Passover. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church under God for him. Hey. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. But we're going to need more than that. Verse 8. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind up thy sandals. Bind on thy sandals. Bind on thy sandals. Read that out loud. 
Bind on thy sandals. I know you're locked down. I know you're in a prison cell. I know you're between two soldiers, but you got to give me something. Act like you're leaving. Put your shoes on. Act like you're going somewhere. Put your shoes on. You can ask Sister Rose if I'm telling the truth when you see her. She's watching live right now. She, she's shouting on the other side of the live stream. I don't see her in her seat right there. But when many years ago, she was believing God for a house and believing God for a house. And I said, Sister Rose, give God something. Give God something to work with. She said, what should I do? I said, I want you to go home, and I want you to pack up your house like you are moving. Take the pictures off the wall and put them in boxes and pack them up and act like you're leaving. She said, all right. You see, you know Cicero, it's a woman of faith. She went home, packed up everything. She, next time I saw her, I said, how'd it go? She said, well, everybody think I'm crazy. I told her, we're leaving. And, man, she packed up everything. Next thing I know, I'm getting a call. The Lord made a way out of no way, bought a big old house out in Blanchard. She had to give God something. Sometimes God is just saying, put your shoes on. Put your shoes on. Just give me something to show me you believe you're going somewhere. It's the law of motion. On the last night in Egypt, God told the children of Israel through Moses, tie up your shoes, then eat this meal. Why? Because I'm bringing you out. Don't eat this meal, the Passover meal, and put the blood on the door with bare feet because you don't believe you're really going anywhere. You're putting the blood on the door, talking about I'm redeemed, but you got all ready for bed. You ain't redeemed. You still act like you're going to stay in Egypt. You got to act like you're coming out of Egypt. You got to put your shoes on and be ready to go somewhere. He said, put your shoes on. And so he did. Oh, read that out loud in verse 8. And so he did. And he saith unto him, cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out. And he went out. (laughs) And he went out. When did he get out of jail? When did he get out of bondage? When he just did the simple thing that God told him to do. Put your shoes on. Show me you believe you're going to move. Show me you believe I'm bringing you out. Give me something. Show me that you'll act on my word. All I need is what you got. All you got is sandals and put them on. That's so good to me. And he went out, verse 9, I'm almost done. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. He's like, this is too, it's it's like, am I dreaming? And they were all gathered praying. Look in verse 12. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. Where many would gather together doing what? Praying. What were they praying for? Peter's release. Look at verse 13. And as Peter knocked, (laughs) they're in the house praying and somebody knocked at the door. They're in there praying, Lord, release Peter. Bring Peter out. Lord, release him. You you make the captives free. We stand on your word, Lord. No weapon formed against Peter shall prosper in the name of Jesus. And they're praying and somebody knocking. Somebody says, I don't get, don't get the door. We're praying right now. No, get the door. Because ask and it shall be given. Help me. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. Your door is knocking. Your answered prayer is here. They opened the door and there was the answer to their prayer. Can you imagine what they told people? Man, we were just praying for you. What'd you do? How'd you get out? Put my shoes on. I'm closing. See all this going over? I'm done right here. Wipe my sweat. This is it. What'd you do to get out? Put my shoes on. What'd you do to get out? I just put my shoes on. You didn't do nothing else? That's all I could do. When they took me away, that's all I had with my clothes and my shoes. I took my shoes off because I wasn't going nowhere. They had me chained down between two soldiers in a prison cell. So I, I kicked my shoes off. But the Lord showed up and said, put your shoes on. You acting like a man that's not going nowhere. I need you to act like somebody that's actually going somewhere. We got to start acting like we're going somewhere. It's time to move on the Word of God. And when we move on the Word of God, that's when he blesses. 
Let me pray for you tonight. Father, we thank you for your word. And I ask right now, Father, by your Holy Spirit, that you would show us how to apply your word to our lives right now. Help us to see, Lord, what you've already put in our lives, what you've already placed there, and how to act in faith where we are. With every head bowed, all eyes closed. Do you see how gracious God is? He meets you right where you are. I worked for a pharmaceutical company. And I delivered legal drugs all over in Louisiana, Arkansas, some Mississippi, Texas. And I had a route that took me in Winsboro, Louisiana. Winsboro, Louisiana, a big old prison out there. In the middle of nowhere. And as I drove out there, I started confessing that one day those prisoners would hear the word of God. This is long before word of God. The ministry started, we went on radio. One of the places we went on was out of Monroe. And I had an inmate in that prison in Winsboro write me a letter. He said, I listen to your broadcast every day. He'd write me almost every week. I'd write him back, share scripture with him. Then I noticed he started sending me mailing stamps, postage stamps. And he said, Pastor James, I don't have any money. All I got is these postage stamps. But I'm sending them to you as an offering for your ministry. And man, I opened up that letter and I saw those postage stamps. And when I tell you it broke me, it broke me. I'd opened up letters that had big offerings. Never had I opened a letter that didn't have but a few postage stamps. I said, Lord, you have to bless this man. He kept writing. But it wasn't long those letters didn't come from a prison. He moved back to his home in Arkansas. Then he started sending tithes, sent a first fruit offering off of his first job that he got out of prison. And I got to hear about the new job, the family restoration, his marriage. He acted on postage stamps. And we're waiting on God to put something real big and we won't move because we say I'd give if I had more I would do more but no, no 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 use what you have God will never ask you to act on something you don't have just act on what you do have and you'll see the power of taking him at his word I invite you to pray with me Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace. And that you don't ask more of me than I can give. And you don't put more on me than I can bear even when it doesn't feel like I trust you by your Holy Spirit keep me in remembrance of what I've heard today I make a decision to hear your word, meditate on your word.
day and night. Speak your word. Pray your word over my life. And by your Holy Spirit, show me how to act on your word. To take you at your word in every area of my life. And I believe by faith your word will not return unto you void. I believe Jesus died for me. That I could live this life of faith. A life that brings you glory. With heaven as my eternal hope. Help me live on this earth in such a way that you are glorified in my life. And when you take the small and you make it big, and when you take my natural and put your super on it, may I never forget, this is the Lord's doing and marvelous in my eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we clap for the Lord in his word tonight? Oh, hallelujah. Well, listen, let's stand together. I know I went a little bit over, but it's all good. Amen. Let's stand together. I'm going to uh, uh, dismiss you now. But if you need prayer, we have altar ministers on both campuses down front. Just come forward. That may be what you need to do is just step out and come forward and let one of these altar ministers pray with you. Otherwise, you are dismissed. Look forward to seeing a Sunday brand new series called Addressing the Issues. Bring somebody to church with you. I love you. Have a blessed week.